Hi, this is ET370, uh, and this is going to be the Lab 4 uh, explanation here. And uh, we're going to walk you through uh, the lab. So what are we going to introduce today? Uh, we're going to look at these uh, two uh, C++ or just common programming uh, entities called a for loop and a while loop. Uh, very useful tools for uh, just filling up arrays, which we'll talk about uh, in the next lab. Um, and then we will look at how a servo works, how to get a servo turning, and uh, kind of bring back the state machine stuff and non-blocking code concepts from the previous lab. Okay, so uh, let's look at a for loop and a while loop. So there's three things. There's the initial value, the incrementer, and the end condition. And what I have here is some sample code where if you recall, we have a loop, but then I have a for loop here and a while loop there. And so think of it as a loop and a loop. And so we're gonna have an initial value. So the for loop is gonna start at the initial value and it's gonna execute this code if this end condition here is true, right? Once it's finishing executing the code, it's going to now increment by this third argument here this value x and then check if this end condition is true still. If it is, it's gonna go in. If not, it's gonna skip. So if you can imagine, this is gonna loop through over and over and over, incrementing x the whole while and making sure the end condition is met. So that's why you need these three values. Now, while loop, the way this is implemented is kind of the same way. It's, a, it's got an initial value. It's checking if the in, end condition is true. If it is, then it'll go in and then it'll increment. You have to put your incrementer here, but this is gonna do the same thing. And so both of these, what they'll do is they'll come into the loop. They will increment their respective variables from zero to 19, in fact, because look at this end condition, it's less than 20. So it'll go from zero to 19, print that to the screen. Once it's done, then it'll go over here, print y equals zero all the way to 19 to the screen, and then go back to the top of the loop here and rinse and repeat. Okay, so um, if you want to go over here to Tinkercad, we can see this in action. So I actually have it um, displayed. So if I look at the code here, this code is uh, basically what we have here on the document. And if I hit start simulation, um, I should be able to see the screen X going from 0 to 19, Y going from 0 to 19. Now, here's some things to know. Let's, let's just be very careful about the syntax. So four parentheses, and look at this, int x equals zero semicolon, x is less than 20 semicolon, x equals x plus one parentheses, right? So you have kind of three arguments for this for loop. And I have these two curly brackets, and here I'm just printing x, right? The syntax for the while loop, you have int y equals zero semicolon, so you have initialized a, a variable. Now you have the end condition, y is less than 20. You're printing it and then incrementing it. Okay, and a little thing to note, x equals x plus one is actually equivalent to x plus equals one or x plus plus. These are actually the same thing. So if I replace this with plus plus, so x plus plus like so, it will actually behave the same way. And we'll run this and you can see x, right? X counts from zero to 19 in increments, right? Okay, now another thing to, um, well, I'll just leave it there. That's actually fine. Uh, another thing to note that x, x does actually take on the value of 20 at the very end of here, right? So imagine this is 19, it gets to here, increments x equals 20. It's gonna check it, is 20 satisfied? No, so then it'll skip this and move on, right? Uh, and it's the same thing for the y. Y is gonna get to 20, it's gonna go here, realize that this can no longer go in, skip it and move on. All right. Okay. By the same token, x equals x minus minus, uh, sorry, x minus minus is the same as x equals x minus one. So if we want to decrement, we can do so. So this is your program one in a nutshell, right? And hopefully you get an understanding what a for loop is and a while loop. Okay. Now, if we go down here, what if we want to modify it? So x starts at three, ends at 25 and counts by two. So this is going to be our second program. And uh, it's pretty easy here. Uh, maybe you pause the video and you can and try to do this for yourself. Um, but if you just want me to go to the answer, this is it. So if x, if I want to start x at 3, I want to count by 2 and end when x actually equals 25. I actually want to see 25 on the screen. What I can do is here, here is change this to 3 and then count by 2. So that means x equals x plus two this time. 
And then I'm going to put actually a 26 there. I'm not going to put 25 because I want X to show 25 to the screen. Okay, now what about the Y? This is a little more complicated. Y equals, uh, I want it to start at 98, but then actually show 72 to the screen, but then count still by one. So here I'm going to go to 98. And this is now going to be, I got to flip this. So instead of less than 20, I got to be greater than 71. Okay. And now I'm still going to count by one. So now this is y equals y minus one. So let's see if this works. I'm going to start the simulation here and look at x. x goes from uh, zero. Well, look at y. Is y doing its thing? It is. Good. It's counting down. Right. And at any point, I should be able to pause it. So let me pause. It is going a little fast here. So let me pull up this monitor. Um, and you can see why, in fact, is doing the correct thing, starting at 98 and going to 72. And X is starting at three and counting up to, well, let's go to the previous one here, starting at three and counting up to 25. So it's doing exactly what we're asking it to do. OK. And I hope you can see that the, um, oops, let me bring that back. Let me move this down. You can see that our uh, adjustment of the initial value and condition and incrementers are allowing us to achieve what we want. Okay, the last thing here asks, what would occur if you forgot the incrementer here in the while loop? And so let's try commenting out. But before we comment it or before we try it, let's try to imagine if in this loop here, this while loop, y never changes. So the very first time y is going to be 98, it doesn't change. This is always going to be true. And what we have is what we call an infinite loop. Y will always be 98. Can you see that this is also blocking code? Both of these are, in fact, blocking code. Because what they do is they you're kind of stuck, right? And so if you do implement a for loop or a while loop, you want it to, you want it to uh, execute quickly, right? So that it can move on and do other things, right? Uh, well, maybe that's your intention, maybe not. Okay, but right now this while is actually setting set as an infinite loop and you'll see why. So I'll hit start simulation. It'll implement the X, but then look at Y. Y is just 98, 98, 98, 98, 98. And then what happens is this code now no longer can go and do anything else. It is stuck in this loop forever. Okay, so you have to be careful about programming infinite loops with the y, uh, while function. All right, okay. Good, let's move on. So from that point, um, we wanna now talk about some hardware. And so the th hardware that I wanna expose you to right now is called a servo. It's a very, very useful package. It has a DC motor. So you can see the DC motor here. Um, it has a little microcontroller and H bridge, which is right here. Um, and this is used to control the DC motor, it takes power and, and supplies current, but it also takes in uh, position data from a, uh, a sensor like a potentiometer, all right? Okay, um, it incorporates a gear train here and um, um, there's an output shaft and usually a servo horn so you can attach like a load to it, a physical load. And so what a servo does is it utilizes feedback to control or take in a commanded signal uh, and power the motor to achieve that desired output angle or rotational speed. So there are basically two types. There's position servos that regulate angle. And so typically they have a range of zero to 180 degrees or continuous turn servos that regulate rotational speed and they have a range of RPMs, okay? So what you'll see is just three leads in a servo, but what's inside the guts of it is all these things that we mentioned before, right? And you want to think, well, what is feedback? So feedback, maybe a good example is cruise control, right? A cruise control on your car, you give it a desired 60 miles an hour that you want to go. It's going to measure, like just like this potentiometer, how fast you're going. And then your throttle is a, a way to adjust it. And so if you're going too slow, like if it's measuring something that's too slow, you're going to hit the gas. If you're going too fast, it's going to hit the brake. So there's a feedback control algorithm in a server that's already pre-built. You don't have to worry about it. And you just tell it, I want you to go to this angle or I want you to go to the speed, depending on what type of servo you have, okay? <clears throat> so let's get one working. Okay, so how do we get one working? Well, well, let's go to a blank Tinkercad here. And uh, in fact, I'm going to just create a new circuit <clears throat> and I'm going to bring in a servo. So I'm going to go in here and go to Arduino, bring in a breadboard. Okay. 
and uh, let's bring in a servo. So if you type in servo into the search, um, let's see, what do we got? Servo, perfect, little micro servo here, okay? So with this servo, I'm gonna rotate it uh, the other way. And there's three terminals. There's signal, there's power and ground. So let's set our signal so that it goes to pin nine. So I'm gonna take this signal and run it straight into pin nine. And I'm gonna make the color orange just so that I can remember that that's the signal. I'm gonna take this power and run it into five volts. And I'm gonna take this, gra uh, this ground one and run it into the ground right there, okay? Um, just, we're not gonna use this right away, but I do wanna put a button in. So just like we did before in a previous lab, let's just put in a button with a 10K pull down resistor. So I'm gonna go here to all, uh, to, oh, we got a resistor here, great. Uh, let's go with button. Yep, we got a button. So let's run that into pin two, just like we had before. I'm gonna make this 10K, all right? So if you remember the, the pull down resistor, what do we have? We have a resistor that goes all the way to 10K and we have the other side of the resistor that goes to five volts. So I can make this, uh, let's make this red, why not? So uh, duh, 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 where's red mm -hmm, here? And let's make actually this one, let's make this one black just so that we can see these are red and black power. Okay, so this is red. And what do I need? I need, uh, this is going around, I'm gonna need this one to go to uh, pin two, okay? And so this is a pull down resistor, right? So normally when this is open, this pin two is zero volts. And when I push the button, it goes up to five volts, okay? We'll, we'll need that later, but now we have our servo, all right? Okay, so I have this all in place, just like I have here. And what you can do is go to your Arduino. So just open up your regular, regular Arduino, go to file examples, and we're gonna go all the way down here to servo, scroll down, scroll down, servo and suite. See that file example, servo suite. Okay, we're gonna control A, copy all that code in right into this code. So go to the code here, make sure it's on text. Yes, yes, yes. Delete all this and put in that servo code. Okay, and now if I run the servo code, what happens? Well, that servo moves back and forth. Excellent. Okay, pretty easy. Remember file, what did, uh, just review file, examples, servo, sweep. Good. I got my button. I got my servo. Everything's good. I just ran this. All right. Okay. So if I look at this code here, let's try to get a handle on what's going on. Notice we're bringing in what we call a servo library. This pound includes servo library. So you need this, right? And there's a bunch of code behind the scenes that you don't even have to worry about, right? But it allows you to do things like create what we call a servo object. So now every time you uh, wanna control this specific servo, you can use this servo object. Now look in the comments, you can control up to 12 servos. So you could have servo one, my servo, servo two, uh, or sorry, servo, my servo one, servo, my servo two, okay? Um, and that's nice. So you can have multiple servos being controlled by your Arduino. Okay, now we're also gonna create a variable called position, which is gonna be actually the desired position we want the servo to go to. And we are gonna attach the servo. So look at this, my servo and my servo, right? These have to match. If I had two servos, I would have my servo one and I had my servo one here. And then I would have my servo two dot attach. And, and notice the nine here corresponds to the pin nine there, okay? So far, so good. Now look at this, we have two loops, we have two, for loops, and you remember what the for loops do now, initialization, end condition, and incrementer. And look at this, plus equals. We've seen this in a minus equals. So what is this saying? It's gonna start off the loops, everything is gonna get set up, it's gonna come here, it's gonna say, hey, position, go to start at zero, and actually use this command, my servo.write position. So I'm gonna tell the servo to go to zero degrees. I'm gonna wait 15 milliseconds. I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna to go to the incrementer and increment this by one. And then I'm gonna check, is this still less than or equal to 180? Sure is. Go in here, write one. And you know, I'm gonna do this over and over and over until I get to 180, right? If I, or sorry, 181, I believe 181. Yes, I'm gonna to go to, so once this is 181, it's gonna skip. So 180 will still be valid. 
right? Notice it's a less than or equals to and not a less than. 180 will still be valid. I'll still be able to write 180 degrees to the servo. And uh, then I'm gonna kick out. I'm gonna go to this one. Oh, and look at this. This is gonna decrement. I'm, my initial condition is 180 and I'm gonna make sure I'm still positive and my decrementer is position equals position minus one. Same thing though here, okay? Now remember, this is blocking code, right? I'm stuck in here, I can't read any other sensors, I just gotta do this. Once I'm done with this, I now gotta do this for loop. So this is in some way bad, but um, I think now that you understand what a for loop, you understand what this is doing. Now let's say I wanna adjust it. So let's say I wanna modify the code so that the sw servo sweeps from 45 to 135 degrees. Well, I think we can do that. So if I want us to go over to 45, what I can do is I, I'm gonna put a 45 as the initial condition. I'm gonna put a 45 here. And instead of going to 180, I'm gonna go 135. So then I'm gonna go 135 back down to 45. And so what you should see here is if this is zero, it's gonna zip over to 45 and then rotate between 45 and 135. And so let's see that happen. Yep, so it goes. 45 to 135 as opposed to 0 to 180. So it only has a 90 degree excursion, right? And I hope this is all making sense, right? It's looping through here, looping through here. Okay, we're, we're moving. So that was the fourth program. So now we're getting into some nitty gritty here. This is bringing back the state machine, okay? So this is gonna be our uh, a slight complication and a good review of last uh, lab. And the last program we'll do in this lab is a more complicated one. Okay, but let's just look at this one first. This one, what do we have here? We want it to behave the same way. We want it to, but we're going to use a two state state machine, which is non blocking, right? So we're going to use that switch case again. And we're going to have, uh, we're going to have it go from four to five, 45 to 135. And so imagine we have two states in the first state, we are going to be just incrementing. If the position reaches 135, then we are going to transition. Okay. Now in state two, we are going to be decrementing. And if the position reaches 45, we are going to transition, right? So it's going to go back and forth. Kind of similar, but it's non-blocking because you can do other things, right? And now let's look at the pseudocode and see if the pseudocode um, we can we can implement see that the pseudocode matches our intention and see how we can implement the pseudocode into actual code. So we kind of have three levels here. We have our intention diagrammed in the state machine diagram. We have the pseudocode, which is just the code without syntax, and then we finally have our real code, which I will implement with you right now. Okay. So what does this uh, pseudocode say? So include the servo library. Good. Include the servo object. Good. We're kind of already doing a lot of this. Initialize a state to one. Ah, initialize a state to one. Okay, so I'm going to have to do that. Initialize a position to 45. We've done that. Ooh, in initialize a variable called change times unsigned long. We did this last week and set it to zero. Good. And initialize another variable called delay time and set it to be 15. Okay. Um, that's new, right? We don't have that here. What else? Attach a servo. Fine, we have that. But now, ooh, tell it to go to, uh, to right position to the servo. Okay, good. And set change time to milli. So these are things we need to add in the setup. Okay, now in the loop, what do we have? A two state state machine. In the first state, let's see what we have. In the first state, do we have an exit condition? We do. If the position happens to be greater than or equal to 135, what are we gonna do? We're gonna to go to state two and leave, right? And we're also, just as a, a good practice, we're gonna set the position to 135 just in case it was set accidentally to 140, right? It's the same thing over here. If you're in state two and if the position happens to be less than 45, we're gonna make sure it's set to 45 and go to state one and break, okay? Those are our exit conditions. Those are the arrows here. Now, what about incrementing? Well, look at this. It's a delay without delay. If millis minus change time is greater than delay time, which is 15 milliseconds, we're going to update change time and we are going to write the position of the servo and increment the position by one. Okay. And vice versa over here, if you're in state two, if 15 milliseconds has passed, you're going to update change time, write the position to the servo and decrement the position by one. Okay. So I know this was a lot, but I think it'll become clear when we implement it. And so let's implement this in code. So 
Uh, let's start at the top. Server library, good. Position, good. Uh, state, there we go. Let's, let's add this int state equals to one. Good, semicolon. Okay, what's next? Ooh, change time with the unsigned long. So uh, unsigned long change time equals zero. Good. And let's say int delay time equals, let's say 15 semicolon. Good. Now, what do we have here? Uh, we have to write the servo position because we want to tell it to go to 45 degrees. So we're going to say my servo dot write position. Okay, so this is going to initially tell it to go to 45 degrees. What's the next one? Next one is set change time to millis. Perfect. Now in here, remember these for loops are blocking code. We are literally going to delete all that. So now we're in the loop and we are going to make our switch case. So when I make a switch case, right, I like to um, build the structure of the switch case first. So switch state, because that's what we're going to look at. And I'm going to put curly bracket, curly bracket, right? So I'm building out my structure of the switch uh, case, right? And then I have case one colon, not semicolon and break and case two colon and break. So now I have my uh, two state state machine ready to go. Okay, so then how do I implement this? All right, so let's start with case one. If, I'm gonna pull a tab, if millis close and open parentheses minus change time is greater than delay time, I am going to now do a few things. What am I going to do? I'm going to update change time. So change time equals millis. Good. I am going to write the servo position. So I'm actually going to copy this. So take the, you know, if you have code already typed out and it works, copy and paste is your friend, right? Don't try to retype. And I'm going to increment servo. So, or the position, sorry, position equals position plus one. Am I going to break? No, because I, am I switch, this is not an exit condition. This is just something I'm doing in case one. Now, the next one is an exit condition. If my position is greater than or equal to 135, now I will leave, right? And I'm going to make sure position equals 135. And I'm going to say state now equals two, and now I can break. And I'm going to close that curly bracket. So I'm making sure everything has nice curly bracket pairs. And I still I have my break here, good, break here, good, exit condition. Okay, watch this. I can copy this whole thing because it's pretty much the same thing and put it into case two. That is so convenient. The other thing I'm going to do is make sure all these things are tabbed nicely so that I can read the code more easily, right? If I don't have these things tabbed nicely, it makes it very difficult to read the code. So notice I'm I'm just tabbing everything over. Now in your regular Arduino, I believe there's a auto format. You can use that. I don't think it has this in a feature in Tinkercad, but if you find it, that would be fantastic. Um, but here is my code all tabbed nicely. It just it really does make it a lot easier. Okay. Um, so let's make sure that I have all the correct things uh, from this tab code correct. So if I'm in case two and if millis minus change time is greater than delay time, I actually want to decrement. So I'm going to put position equals position minus one. Notice the difference here, right? Plus one, minus one. And if my position is not greater than 135, if it is less than or equal to 45, then I'm going to set my position to 45, and I'm now going to transition back to state one. Okay, so I just implemented this. Now, if you are stuck, I have the code here already typed up for you. So you can just literally copy this in. But I'm hoping you can do what I just did and go off the pseudocode and directly implement it. So I hope I didn't make any mistakes. Let's see if this can work. Nice, no mistakes. First try, that's very rare. We usually make some kind of mistake, forgotten semicolon, curly bracket, but I hope you can see this works, right? And so it's going from 45 to 135, back to 45. Notice I haven't used the button yet. I will use that in the next one.
but I just uh, but you can see that this code now is cycling through. It is now just flowing through, and if anything is not met, it just skips over, right? Okay. All right. So let's stop the simulation. We've gotten to this point. Okay. So the last piece of code that we want to do is this more complicated one. Now it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. All we want to implement is a way to push the button and have it pause. So we want this thing to go back and forth, back and forth. And I push the button, it pauses. And if I push the button again, it comes back, right? All right, so what do we need? We need three states. We need a do nothing state, an increment state, and a decrement state. So state one, two, three. Now look at this. I have a way if, if, uh, if my position is greater than 135, I go this way. If my position is less than 45, I go this way, I go back to state two. So you can see all the transitions just drawn out. These state machine diagrams just make it so much easier to prototype out how the information is gonna flow in your code, okay? All right, now let's say I press, I'm in state two and I happen to press the button, look at this. I can go back to state one. If I'm state three, I push the button. I can go back to state one as well. But now notice I have this new variable called state previous. And the reason why I have the state previous variable is so that I know where I'm coming from. So for example, if I was in state two and I press the button and I press the button again, I wanna, how would I know whether to go back to state two or go to state three? Well, what the idea of the state previous is, if I'm gonna leave state two, I'm gonna set state previous to the value two and then when I hit the button again, I am going to go to state the whatever state previous was. And in this branch, it, it happens to be two. In this other branch, it happens to be three. The other thing I need to do is update the change time millis for this little timer in here, right? Okay, so um, this is just an example. This is a, yeah, we have a do nothing state, incrementer state and decrementer state, right? Okay, and the button will transition state one to two and back and state one to three and back. Okay, I think this is pretty clear, but let's go and see if we can implement this. But first we, we need the pseudocode. And look, I have the pseudocode written for you guys right here. Okay, I also have, I believe I have the code too. So, but let's just again, try to implement this off the uh, pseudocode. Okay, so notice I'm gonna have to have three states, okay? And let's look at the pseudocode and see what's going on. Servo library, good. Servo object, good. State one, good. Oh, state previous, that's a new thing, right? Okay, so that's gonna be new here. So I can even put that in now. Int state previous equals two, good. Initialize position to 45, good. Initialize change times unsigned long, good. Have that. Delay time to 15, good. Ooh, now I gotta put in all my button stuff. I'll do that later, but this is exactly from last week's homework. Button pin it to button state and button state previous to zero and zero because we need to record the transition of the button. Okay, we need to do a pin mode for the button pin, set it as input. Okay, that's not there yet, but now we have attached the servo done, write the position of the servo done, and change the millis done. That's already done. So this is new and these are new. Okay, what else do we have in the loop? We need to do that store the previous button state and update the button with a digital read. Not implemented here yet, but you've done this before in the previous lab. Okay, now in your switch case, you're gonna have three states, one, two, and three, right? Here you only had two. Now, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have a do nothing state and these original case two and three, or sorry, case one and two are basically cases two and three. So we'll modify those to two and three. So let's see what happens. I am going to have a state one. And if I detect a button press, and remember, how do we do this? If button state is high and button state previous is low. Okay, good, remember that. We're gonna set the change time to millis and we are going to whatever state previous was, set state to state previous. Now we initialized it, so that means the first time we will go to two, okay, and break, all right? So that is our exit condition for state one, okay? Now for state two, it's gonna be looking very similar to case one. You still have this, right? Okay, good, so you're gonna increment. You still have your button press, oh, sorry, you're still gonna have your position greater than 135, but now you're gonna go to state three instead. And now you're gonna have this ability to go back and pause. So if your button is pressed, you're gonna set your state previous to two and go back, 
right? And so what I'm hoping you're seeing is these two things are these two uh, end termination conditions or, or, or leave conditions are exactly the arrows, the leaving arrows here. So I hope you can see how the pseudocode correlates to this diagram. And then case three is nearly identical to case two, except that we are uh, decrementing the position. We are going to um, set state previous to three if the button is pressed, and we are now looking at 45, okay? And we're going to state two, okay? So now let's go and implement this. So I'm gonna go back to the top and just double check. I have everything. Good, servo library in state, state previous is two, good. Position is 45, good, 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 good. Oh, gotta do the button. So int button pin equals two, good, int button state equals zero good int button state previous equals zero good okay now what about in the setup we can say pin mode button pin as input okay so that's this guy here um, we've already done this now we're in the loop and we ooh, we got to go right here in the loop we're going to say button state previous equals button state perfect and button state is equal to digital read, digital read of the button pin, okay? All right, I think we're good here. All right, so now we have the cases. So I'm gonna actually make this case two and case three now and add another case, case one, case one colon, and I'm gonna put a break, right? Don't forget my breaks, case break, case break, case break. Okay, so what do we have in case one? Case one, I already have it written, if the button is pressed, do this. Okay, so if the button is pressed, and how do we say detect the button press? If button state equals equals high two equals sign and double ampersand button state previous equals equals low. And I'm gonna put my curly bracket sandwich, good, okay. And what am I going to do? I'm going to say my state goes to whatever my previous state was. So state previous. Initially, this is two. Is that right? The very first time? Yep, state previous would be two. Good. What else am I going to do? I need to set my timer for the change time. Okay, good. Close and open friends. Okay, so I have my case one fully done. I hope you're seeing the benefit of the pseudocode in this one, right? Because I can just literally look at the pseudocode and then type in the syntax, right? Okay, now I'm in case two. All right, great, I already have this already programmed. Good to reuse code, right? This one's done. What about this one? Is the exit condition done? Almost, uh, I gotta go to case three instead, but that one's done. So the only one I have to do is this middle one if I press the button, okay? Ooh, look at this, I already have a button press. I'm gonna put that right here. If the button is pressed, what am I gonna do? If the button is pressed, I am going to say state previous. Where am I coming from? State previous, I would be going from two. So I'm gonna say equals two, right? So this, I will say, let's uh, state one know where to go, right? And then what else do I have to do here? Uh, set state. Uh, I'm gonna say state goes to one, okay? And I'm gonna break out, right? And here you can see why we have breaks. So I have three breaks. I have one break for the overall case. I have a break for each exit condition, okay? All right, now I go to case three and look at this. This is still the same, slightly different. Now I'm gonna bounce back between uh, three and two. Right, so this went to three, good. This would go back to two, good. And I can take this button code here, instead of retyping, retyping it, excuse me, I can reuse the code. And so if button state is high, button state previous low, my state previous this time would be three, okay? And let's, again, let state one know where to go. All right, I think I have everything, curly bracket for the loop, curly bracket for the switch case, right? Nothing else changed here. I think this is correct. So let's see if this works. What I want to see is this thing cycle back and forth. At any time, if I hit the button, whether I'm in state two or three, it's going to pause. Please work without any uh, problems. Yes, no errors. OK, so right now it went to 45. Why did it just do that and not, not do anything? Because look, 
my initial thing is state one and I told it position go to 45 and I said that right here. Okay, so that just executed line 31 and right now I'm just sitting in case one I'm not doing anything. It's waiting for me to press the button. Let's see if this works. State previous is now two. Hopefully it goes into two. Ready? Yes, I'm going into state two. I'm incrementing, incrementing. Does it automatically go to state three like before? Yes, it turns around. It's going back to state three. I think it's bouncing back and forth. And at any time you could put serial prints in here and just see the states uh, that, it's, it, that are being activated. Okay, so that means at any point, if I press this button, it should bounce me back into state one and pause. Yes, it's pausing. Oh, so good. If I pr pr uh, press it again, yes, it keeps going in the same direction it was going. Okay. If I go this way, pause, and it keeps going, I can keep pausing it as often as I want. Nice. This works, right? Okay. So I hope you're seeing that this is uh, not too bad. Sure, there's a, some copy and paste, copy and paste your friend, but as long as you understand how these state machine diagrams are correlating to the pseudocode, um, I hope you're gonna have a, um, a good time figuring this out and be able to implement this. Okay, that's pretty much it. The last thing you guys are gonna have to do is implement this crazy homework, right? And this homework looks a little insane, but it's really not too bad. And what I'm gonna do is I, I have the code implemented here. Let me see if I can pull it up and show you. So uh, I'm gonna go over here. I have a uh, lab for homework, is this it? Okay, what I have here is my intention is so that it still goes back and forth, but it's gonna do a pattern and, and uh, I'm gonna play it. So start simulation. Okay, so it's gonna, Go to state one here. And if I press the button, it's gonna go out of pause mode and it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then pause. So it's 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 got an odd number. Three, four. Okay, let's see, let's see if it does come on. Yep. Good. Now it's gonna pause. Now if it automatically after five seconds passes, what I wanted to do is start up again. I'm not pressing the button, right? So this perpetually will now do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and stop at the bottom. So let's see it do that. Okay, good. And notice I'm not pressing the button at all. This is all automatic, right? So it's having to count once it kind of goes back into this mode seven times, right? And good, it pauses. It's waiting five seconds, right? And after five seconds passing, it's going to start up again. It's go boop, 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 right? And let's see it do that. Good, right? Now, here's the thing. I do have the button at any point. I don't want to lose that pause feature. Watch this, pause. Good. But if I don't press anything, it'll automatically after five seconds, just continue where it left off. Okay. So this is what I want you to implement for your homework. All right. So I can, I can pause it and I can press it and unpause it. Right. Or if I pause it and it just automatically, it waits for five seconds, it'll automatically just continue. Okay. So how did I, uh, implement the state machine diagram? Well, let's look at it. I'm going to need two change times. I needed one change time for just my normal 15 milliseconds, but I'm going to need another change time for the five second pause while I'm in the do nothing state. Okay, what else am I going to need? I'm going to need a counter that's counting seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm going to need a way to reset that counter. So let's just look at the state machine diagram. I would do nothing state, increment state, and a decrement. So it doesn't change the number of cases. It just changes the transitions. And if you look carefully, what am I doing? I This is very similar to the previous one. State 1 equals 1. State previous equals 2. Position is 45. Change time leave. That's a new change time equals millis. Set counter to 0. OK. So if I don't do anything, if the button is pressed or a big or five seconds passes, now I'm looking at change time leave, leave I'm going to uh, go to uh, state previous, right? Which in this case would be two, 
right? And then I'm gonna set my change time millis and set my counter to zero, okay? So every time I leave, I'm resetting my counter, right? Okay, so here, once I'm in two, how do I leave state two? I can either press the button, or if my counter is too much, if it's greater than or equal to seven, those are ways I will leave state two, right? Of course, I gotta store the previous and I gotta set my change time leave to milli so that I know my counter is being reset, okay? And then otherwise, if my position is greater than 135, I'm gonna go to state three. If I'm in state three, how do I leave? Well, if my position is less than 45, I'll go this way, or if a button is pressed, or if my counter is seven, okay? These are all ways to leave. How would I come back to state three? Well, if state previous was ever set to three and I happened to be in state one and either the button was pressed or five seconds passed, that's how I would go to state three, okay? Now it seems a little complicated, but it's not too bad. Fortunately or unfortunately, you will need to write the pseudocode. Ooh, ooh, yes, you will. But I, I highly recommend you just modify this pseudocode that's already given to you, right? You already have state one, two, three, and you modify the code that you just did for the last program. If you understand how this, these uh, state transitions work, it should not be too bad to change the pseudocode and, and the real code and see this in action. All right, good luck, and I hope you learned something in this lecture. Okay, we'll see you at the next one.